It's only eight miles from Cromer to Blakeney, where I'll be stopping for the night. But over that short distance, the wind died and the surface of the sea took on that greasy swell you sometimes get when the wind suddenly dies and the bigger wave patterns from the squalls haven't quite settled down yet. That short distance also sees a complete transformation in the geography of the Norfolk coast. Up until now, the North Sea has been tearing great chunks out of the sand cliffs and slowly moving it south at a rate of around half a million cubic metres a year. But after Cromer, longshore drift goes into reverse and starts pushing the sand westwards and piling it up along the coast of North Norfolk and then dumping millions of tonnes of the stuff around the corner and into the wash. Over the next few months, I'll be sailing around a giant sand pit which the North Sea gales and the four knot 20 foot tides continually grade and reshape into ever more beautiful sinuously sensual shapes. Channels are carved and banks are built in one tide, only to be destroyed in the next. A single gale will rewrite the geography of mile after mile of coastline. Then there is the mighty wash, a mysterious place where the ever-shifting channels and shallows mean that it's only the bravest, most confident owners of deep keelers will ever venture here for fun rather than passage making. But those of us where a grounding is just part of the entertainment we can go almost anywhere we please. This is a place where migrating flocks of birds come to gorge themselves on the salt marshes and pastures behind. Seals loaf on sandbanks and bob to the surface, feet from the boat to blink at you with their questioning eyes. Their presence in such numbers is a sure sign of unpolluted waters. This is where I will be spending the next few months. A land of tiny channels through the salt marshes that I can explore in the slug or in the small sailing canoe I've yet to build. Here, in this shifting landscape of a million different grades of sand, I can take long walks up the almost dry creeks in the company of Jill, Maggie and the GPS. The water is clear enough for you to see the crabs scuttling away from my monstrous feet. I meet a man who catches fish with his bare hands. Will you catch him or not? Yeah. See, like you're deaning yourself in the sand. Oh, yeah, yeah. See? Yeah, he's. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Summertime, I come up here, you know, with a spike. Yeah. You see him laying just. Occasionally you come across an utterly magic little naturally formed swimming hole where the water suddenly deepens enough for Jill to lose touch with the bottom and get a really good swim. The water in these holes has picked up the heat from the land so it's comparatively warm. It's clean, clear, filtered and changed twice daily by the tides. As I walk, I take the GPS along the low spots, so that in a few hours or a few days time, we can return in the boat and sail safely in the same places. Sometimes we explore the routes that take us across the wide open spaces of the sandbars that adorn the mouths of these estuaries, following the hidden channels below us and watching the shadow of the boat gilded and enhanced by the play of light through water. Other GPS tracks take us deep inland through the salt marshes drifting with the incoming tide, using just a bit of Genoa to give steerage. On occasion, touching the bottom for a moment or two before being swept onwards by a gentle, inexorable pressure from the incoming water. And when I stuff up in the wrong place and end up broadside on, 
The slug really feels the power of the surging water as it tugs at all three keels. Just amazing. These, it's moving around the bow and the stern of the boat and filling in behind and creating these whirlpools. Oh, there's a, there was a seal just playing in it just now. We're going to spend the coming winter here and see what it's like to live on the boat when it's cold enough to snow and a northerly is making Incredible. life uncomfortable on the mooring and even worse on the town pontoons. Wells is being a bit rough. It's the tail end of a storm coming through here. The tide is still coming in. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be a bit of a noisy. I'm going to get to know these harbours and salt marshes better than some of the locals. I shall take the boat wherever I can get her. After that, it'll be journeys by the sailing punt. I shall cycle the sea walls and the village streets, and I'll walk the sandbars and creeks. That is snow on the sand behind those birds. Cool. <laughs> I aim to find a drying mooring somewhere that I can walk to the boat between tides, lugging my gear across sand rather than risking a dinghy in the cold and the dark. I want to sit in the cockpit and watch the sea reclaim the creeks by miraculously flowing uphill. You don't get to see that happen anywhere else than at sea. I wanted to hear the water as it slaps on the bottom of the boat before she lifts and is once more a live thing tugging on her mooring telling you that she's ready when you are. But all that is ahead of me. It's still summer and I'm on passage with the beast making all the running and the tide is against me. Ahead of us, the beacon that marks the entrance to Blakeney Harbour. The first of a whole series of spectacular tidal refuges along this coast. I like the look of the place, some stout motorboats. But as I enter the harbour, I see the other sort of water user. I look around and seek an empty mooring buoy I can pick up and then wait for the ebbing tide to settle the slug safely down onto her bilge keels. And I get a look at the neighbours as they also take the ground. I'm anxious to go for an evening walk, and there's no walk as sweet as the one you take after a successful landfall. This is going to be a great summer. Mm -hmm.